Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about how water to cement ratio affects the strength of concrete. Of all the ingredients in our concrete, water is the least expensive. It's also the easiest to add. Sometimes when you're making concrete and it's not quite right, it's very tempting to get the water hose out, just add a little bit here and there. If that water is not accounted for in the design, it could be really bad. Let's, today, we're going to just focus on how water impacts strength. We'll talk about why in a future video, but right now, just how water impacts strength. So although water is inexpensive and easy to add, we have to closely watch how much we add to our concrete mixtures. We typically express everything by this water to cement ratio. And this was first developed, this concept was first developed by Abrams, okay, in about 1910. He says the mass of the water divided by the mass of the binder is equal to the water to cement ratio. And this is a very, very critical factor. And this is going to impact the strength and also the durability of our concrete. But today, we're just going to talk about strength. And again, I'll explain why in a future video. But the strength of concrete um, is a mixture or a function of all of these different things. It's a function of the water to cement ratio, how well it's consolidated. That's how well you get the air bubbles out, how well you kind of bring everything together. The age of the concrete and the curing. Let's talk about these. We need to consolidate the concrete to remove all of the air voids because air is not very strong, okay? And we also, but we also want some air inside of it for freeze-thaw durability. We'll talk more about that coming up. So you don't want to get all the air out. You just want to get the big bubbles out. They're not that helpful. Curing is where we keep the concrete moist and at a reasonable temperature. Why do we do that? Because we want to promote the reaction. We want to promote the hydration to continue to go. So it can produce a tighter and tighter microstructure. Again, more on that coming up. With age, the strength is going to also increase as long as there is moisture present. As long as the internal relative humidity is above about 75%, then reaction will continue to happen. For example, I'm showing compressive strength over here. I'm showing time down here. And most of the time, people talk about what the strength needs to be at 28 days. 28 day compressive strength is very, very common. Modern concretes, as in concretes over since about the mid 1990s, gain strength much, much faster than concretes we had a long time ago. And the older the concretes are, the slower the strength gainers were. So 28 day was this number that you really needed to wait until the concrete had gained a large amount of its strength. But in modern concretes, we're going to see by about not, by about 14 days that it's gained anywhere between 90 to 95% of its actual compressive strength at 28 days. And it, even at seven days, it's at 70 to 80% of the compressive strength that it's going to have again at 28 days, even at three days, it's going to have 40 to 50% of the ultimate strength that it'll have at 28 days. Now, why is this important? And why do people do that? Well, they've actually designed cements to do this on purpose to get strength earlier and earlier and earlier. Why? Because we want to open our projects as fast as possible. We want to get people driving on our roads and our bridges or get our buildings open so that we can, the businesses can move in and start, start making money or people can start living inside and not having to live someplace else. These are all reasons why the cements have been designed to become stronger earlier. Now, I don't know if that's always a good thing. And, and again, more, more discussion about that coming up. But that's the way it is. And I don't think it's going back. I don't think we're, we're going back to the way it used to be. So this is why a lot of people will test things at like seven days. And if the answer is close enough, or maybe it even exceeds what they might need um, later, then they'll say it's good and they'll just keep going. Okay. This is also helpful to be able to remove forms early. So again, we can just keep building as fast as possible. We, 
You should know, though, that concrete keeps curing, even over years and years and years and years. And after about 10 years, that strength at like 28 days, it may be between about 50% to twice what it was earlier in his life. Yeah, amazing material, right? Just keeps getting stronger over time. And again, this is an example for a modern cement with no supplementary cementitious materials and no admixtures, okay? These may change things a little bit. We're going to more learn more about that coming up. Here's some real data. Well, this is data that I didn't collect, but it was collected by and um, actually reported in the ACI, the American Concrete Institute 211. That's the mixture design document. This is where someone has made some concrete mixtures. One of them had about 2% error in it, and one of them had about 6% error in it. And you can see that 2% has a higher strength than the 6%. So, so why did they have 6% error? Why, why would you add error? Why would you make the strength go down? Well, that error is actually really important for freeze-thaw durability. Okay, so you need some air for that. And I'll trade off maybe 1,000 PSI or 500 PSI for maybe 60 or 70 more years of life. That's what it is. Anyway, some of these mixtures have 6% error and some of these mixtures have about, um, about 2% error in them. And these are real data points that were actually measured. And realize that each one of these data points are actually probably an average of three samples. And there's some kind of like... Uh, distribution here of the data, okay? But that's not given. They just gave you the average value. Again, you can see these data points. And it's pretty common to assume that the data is linear in between these two. And this is a, a, a method or, or a technique that a lot of people use. They'll have a concrete mixture, one that they think's about right, and they'll use different water cement ratios and they'll measure to see how the strength changes with water cement ratio. And this is called a three point curve. Now notice there's way more points here than three. That's pretty common too. A lot of times people make like four or five point curves, but again, for whatever reason, we still call them three point curves. I guess you could theoretically get away with just three points if you needed to. And this curve is going to be extremely dependent on the materials that are used. So be careful. You can't just go using three, any old three-point curve. You need to use it for your materials, for your application. But, so to get these curves, we usually prepare a mixture with three different water cement ratios. These are called three-point curves. I talked about this before. People may use more, but we still call them three-point curves. And once you have a curve like this, the real power of it is that if you know what strength you need, you can pick off the water cement ratio, or if you know what water cement ratio you have, you can pick off what strength. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go back up and look. For example, if I wanted 5,000 PSI concrete and I needed to use about 6% air, I can say that I need a water cement ratio that's pretty close to 0.40 pretty close. And if I was, can live with a higher air content, or sorry, a lower air content, if I'm using like an internal structure, then I can actually get, get away with a water cement ratio. It's a little bit higher. Okay, there's a 0.48 shown there. That's how these work. Pretty straightforward. All right. Instead of having a graph, you could also make a table. And you can interpolate between the two points. And this is actually the same data that's in that graph I showed you before. And again, this is from data from ACI 211 for, a, for an example mixture design. And this may not represent other mixture designs. You have to, again, build these curves from the materials that you have. And, but because of the variability in our actual materials and the testing, we actually need to design our concrete for a higher strength than we need. What do I mean by that? Well, if I have 4,000 PSI that I need for my actual design, I have to put a little bit of a safety factor. I have to over-design my concrete so that I'm sure that I will get, for a large number of my tests, something like 99% of them, I'll get the answer, the strength that I need. 
And the amount of overdesign that you have to use is a function of how consistent the compressive strengths are from the testing. So if I can make very, very consistent concrete and get very, very consistent compressive strengths, then theoretically I have to have a lower overdesign. And I have to use less costly cement in my concrete. Typically, if I hold my pace content constant, that is. This is the subject of the next video.